lot of promises, but just for simplicity, I've put there a dictionary definition. A promise is an undertaking or an assurance to do or not to do something specified, to give grounds for expectation, usually of success, improvement or excellence. So a promise by its very nature speaks of the future, doesn't it? It speaks of potential. So this will happen in the future subject to certain things taking place. So a young child might be offered a reward if he or she tidies his or her bedroom. Okay, a particularly tasty reward. An employee might be promised a pay rise if his or her standard of work continues or rises. But of course, those promises are dependent upon obedience. If the child doesn't tidy his or her bedroom, then maybe they won't go to McDonald's. If the employee's standard of work falls, then, then the pay rise won't be received. What then of, of God's promises? Well, they also speak of something which is future. They also hold out a reward for those who embrace them. But as with most promises, they are conditional. Nowhere in the Bible do we read that the God of the Bible is going to reward those who openly claim that he doesn't exist or disobey him in their lives. This evening, then, we're going to look at the promises that were made to David. And in looking at them, we're going to think of, of five key areas. We're going to try to answer five key questions. The first question is, who then was David? We're thinking about promises that were made to this man. We really ought to try to work out who he was first. We're going to think about the promises that God made to him, what promises were made. We really want to think about the time scale of the promises. Of course, in David's day, these things were future, but have they been fulfilled by now? Because David lived many years ago. Are they still waiting to be fulfilled? Are they yet future to us? Could the promises be speaking about Solomon? Because this is an argument which is sometimes put forward. In fact, it was presented in the days of the Lord Jesus Christ, that the promises were only about Solomon, and perhaps most importantly, how do these promises apply to us today? Well, let's think about David first of all. From time to time, people arise to positions of great authority, perhaps great rulership, who are maybe unusual, shall we say. Not the ideal choice. And logically speaking, we would say that was the same for David. You see, he was the youngest son in a family. He had seven older brothers. He didn't have any great, uh, great authority or experience of himself. He was a shepherd boy. And yet he was chosen by God and he was promised great things. Mention the name David to do with Israel today, and perhaps we are thinking of the flag of Israel, which has upon it this star made up of, of two triangles, and it is called the Star of David. Now, sometimes we get some indication as to whether somebody in the Bible is of particular import by just seeing how often the name appears. And the name David appears about a thousand times in the Bible, most of them in the Old Testament, some of them in the New and this fact alone emphasises to us that here is someone of the utmost importance if we genuinely believe the Bible to be true. So what do we know about David? Can we start please in 1 Samuel chapter 16? Now let's just set the scene for you. For many years Israel, having come out of Egypt and entered the land that was promised to their forefathers, the nation of Israel was ruled over by men and sometimes women who were called judges and the last of the judges was a man called Samuel in Samuel's day the nation of Israel came to him and they said we want a king we actually we want to be like the nations round about us give us a king and so God chose a king for them 
The man's name was Saul. Initially, he was a good king, but that didn't last. He fell away very badly towards the end of his reign. And so God said to Samuel, and indeed this message was relayed to Saul, God has chosen somebody else. You are now rejected. Another will take your place. And now we pick up the record in 1 Samuel 16. And the Lord said unto Samuel, How long wilt thou mourn for Saul, seeing I have rejected him from reigning over Israel? Fill thine horn with oil and go. I will send thee to Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I have provided me a king among his sons. And although we're not told it at this stage, this one, this particular son of Jesse, there in Bethlehem, who would take Saul's place, was the man David, provided by God. Interesting word, that provided. I have provided me. Literally in the Hebrew, that means I have seen. God, as it were, was, was looking out for the right man, and he had seen in David something very special. And David was the one who would take Saul's place. And we're not going to look at these passages in detail, but the same <coughs> word is used back in Genesis 22. It's quite a common Old Testament word. But God says to Abraham, God will, or rather Abraham says to his son, God will provide himself a lamb. And again in Genesis 22:14, the mount of the Lord, it shall be seen. It's exactly the same word. So these two great men, recipients of great promises, the same word is used. God was looking out for something special. He's still looking for that same attitude today, and he wants to see it in you and me. Now, 1 Samuel 16 describes how David was the chosen one. Despite the fact that his brothers may have looked the part, indeed one of them particularly, as soon as he came out, Samuel thought, well, this is the one. He's got to be the chosen one. God says to Samuel, no, don't, don't look on the outward appearance. You're looking on his height. He's a big, tall, strong, good-looking man. No, I'm looking on the heart, says God. And the one who thought right was David, and we're told that elsewhere. Why was David chosen? Because his heart was right. And so in Acts 13, we read of this man, David, the son of Jesse, a man after God's own heart which would fulfill all God's will. So although, yes, David almost certainly was a strong and good-looking man, he wasn't chosen because he looked right. He was chosen because he thought right and because he acted right. And so he was anointed. Verse 13 of 1 Samuel 16, Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed David in the midst of his brethren, and the Spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward, so Samuel rose up and went to Ramah. Anointed there by Samuel in the midst of his brethren at the instruction of God. Now as we move on through the life of David in the books of Samuel, this is what we find. We read in chapter 17 of his battle with Goliath, this great giant nine feet six tall we're told how david used a sling and a stone to prosper over this man blessed by god he prevailed over the philistine with a sling and a stone there was no sword in david's hand an indication of the the mindset of this man that he believed that god was going to preserve him in that battle we move on through samuel we see how as a result of this he was loved by Jonathan but hated by Saul because Saul knew very well this was the one that was going to come and take his throne. And so he became a fugitive and, and he was fleeing from Saul. Saul sought to kill him and a number of chapters in 1 Samuel describe this time. Ultimately Saul was slain and so David became king, firstly over Judah and then over all Israel. He ruled from Jerusalem. There then followed a time of peace in David's life. Peace between Israel and the Gentile nations round about. And at this time, we pick up the record in 2 Samuel 7, part of which Ian read for us. Here we have promises that were made to David and that can apply to us. Now, the beginning of the chapter speaks of David's desire to build a house for God. It was a very good desire. 
However, David wasn't to be the one who would build this house. Another of David's descendants would be the one who would oversee this building project. Nonetheless, we'll pick up the record in verse 10, and here we have the promises. We're going to read from verse 10 right through to the end of verse 16, where all the promises appear, and then we're going to go through them one by one and try and make some sense of these words. So, 2 Samuel 7 and verse 10. Moreover, God says, I will appoint a place for my people Israel and will plant them that they may dwell in a place of their own and move no more. Neither shall the children of wickedness afflict them any more as before time. And as since the time that I commanded judges to be over my people Israel and have caused thee to rest from all thine enemies, also the Lord telleth thee that he will make thee and house and when thy days be fulfilled and thou shalt sleep with thy fathers I will set up thy seed after thee which shall proceed out of thy bowels and I will establish his kingdom he shall build an house for my name and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever I will be his father and he should be my son if he commit iniquity I will chasten him with the rod of men and with the stripes of the children of men, but my mercy shall not depart away from him, as I took it from Saul, whom I put away before thee. And thine house and thy kingdom shall be established for ever before thee, and thy throne shall be established for ever. Now I don't believe it is overstating it to suggest that these are some of the most important verses in the whole of the Bible. God's promises to this man, David. Six key promises were made. Three of them describe a ruler, and three of them describe the ruler's work. What I've done is I've listed them here on the slide, not in the order in which they appear in the Bible, but in terms of the time scale of their fulfilment. So, Promise number one, it's there in verse 12, that there was going to be a ruler who would be descended from David, but he would be born after David's death. Promise number two is that this ruler, as well as being descended from David, was going to be God's son. Promise number three, this ruler would receive God's Mercy. I don't want to worry too much about the word mercy there, but I, I believe that this also means blessing there in verse 15. So this particular ruler descended from David, God's descendant also would be a, a person who would be blessed by God. Promise number four. Do you remember at the start of the chapter, David wanted to build a house? There's a key word in the chapter. You can underline the word house. It's there time and again. The ruler would build a house for God's name. It's there in verse 13. Here's our fourth key promise. Promise number five, although going back to the start of this section there in verse 10, that Israel ultimately would be at peace in their own land, no longer oppressed by their enemies. And the final promise, the ruler's throne was going to be established for ever. So here we have the promises. Let's go through them one by one. Let's see what God meant through Samuel, Nathan rather, speaking to David. How do they apply to us today? How can we be beneficiaries of these things? So the first two promises then talk about this ruler. He was going to be David's descendant. He was also going to be God's son, born after David's death. Now come please to Luke chapter 1. And this perhaps is the easiest of the, of the promises this evening. For us to understand and to identify. Here we are in the, the time of uh, the early days of the New Testament. Prior to the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we're picking up the record in the life of Mary. So, Luke chapter 1 and verse 26. 
And in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin espoused to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. So we're introduced to this young woman. We're told that she is a virgin. Her name is Mary and she is descended from David. She is of the house of David. She is the the, the great, 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 insert plenty more great, daughter of Mary, granddaughter of, of, of David. Let's pick up the record in verse 30. What did the angel Gabriel say to this woman? The angel said to her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favour with God. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb, and bring forth a son, and shalt call his name Jesus. He shall be great, and shall be called the Son of the Highest, and the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David, and he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. Notice the key phrase there in verse 32, as far as we are concerned this evening, the throne of his father David. So this promised seed called Jesus, end of verse 31, was going to be a descendant of David. There we see our first key promise, don't we? That this ruler, descended from David, born after his death, this is the Lord Jesus Christ. Now what about the second promise there? This ruler was going to be God's son. Well, we don't need to look very far. Verse 35 of Luke chapter 1. The angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Spirit, or the power of God, will come upon thee. The power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. So here we have our first two promises identified very clearly. It's the Lord Jesus Christ, descended from David, but also the Son of God. Let's move on to our third key promise then, that this ruler would receive God's mercy or God's blessing, unlike Saul from whom these things departed. Now why wasn't Saul a worthy recipient of the blessings of God ultimately? Because he chose to do his own thing. That's why. Because Saul was a man who had his own rule book. He did what he wanted to do. The Lord Jesus Christ wasn't like that. Jesus Christ was obedient to the word of God and the instructions of God right throughout his life. And so the blessing of God never departed from him. And indeed, he will continue to be blessed by God when he comes again to reign. The ultimate blessing by God was given him when he was raised from the dead and granted immortality. We move on to our fourth promise then, that the ruler would build a house for God's name. Now... Is this a literal building, a literal house, or a temple, or is it something more? Well, in fact, the answer is there are two completely different kinds of houses that this speaks about. Firstly, yes, it does speak of a literal building. And there is a sense in which these promises were fulfilled in Solomon's day. You see, Solomon who was one of the sons of David, who reigned after him in Jerusalem, was initially a great king. Very powerful, very wise, I would suggest to you, arguably the second wisest man who has ever lived. Very rich, very influential. He reigned over a, a kingdom of great peace. And indeed, he built a temple. And it was a marvellous construction. That's a, a cross section there, just showing how much gold there was in this temple. It was a building unlike any other, so much so that when it was first built, that the presence of God, the glory of God filled the house and those who were inside couldn't, couldn't stay in because of the glory of God filling it. That's how wonderful this house was. However, in its fullest sense, that promise about building a house can never truly apply to Solomon. Why? Because Solomon fell away towards the end of his life. He worshipped pagan gods, he turned away from the truth, and he was told by God that he would be punished because of it. Jesus Christ will do what Solomon could not do. He will build a house which will last forever. Because when he comes to reign as king, there will be a temple built. Can you come please? Again, keep a marker in Samuel, but come please to 
Isaiah chapter 56. And here we have one of the many prophecies in Isaiah about the Lord Jesus Christ. One of the many prophecies that talk about the work of Jesus which is yet to be done when he returns to reign. So Isaiah 56 and verse 6 please. Also the sons of the stranger that join themselves to the Lord to serve him and to love the name of the Lord to be his servants. Everyone that keepeth the Sabbath from polluting it and taketh hold of my covenant. Even then will I bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices shall be accepted upon mine altar. For mine house shall be called an house of prayer for all people a literal house a temple for all nations to come to indeed in the days of the lord jesus he he was very critical of the leaders of the nation because of what they had done to the house that existed in his day built in herod's time a literal house will be built in the age to come and there are many places that talk about this so it shall come to pass in the last days the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains, shall be exalted above the hills, and all nations shall flow unto it. And many people shall go and say, Come ye and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. And he will teach us of his ways. We will walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. Now that situation has never existed. It didn't exist in Solomon's day. It didn't exist in the days of the Lord Jesus Christ. But it will exist when he comes again. And if we had time we could look at Zechariah 14. And then Ezekiel chapters 40 right through to chapter 48. Which describe this great temple which will be built in the days of the kingdom of God upon the earth. However... There is also a, a spiritual application to these words. Just look at this. This is taken from one of the letters of the Apostle Paul, Ephesians chapter 2, commencing at verse 19, where Paul says, Now, therefore, ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints, and of the household of God. And are built, it's the language of a building, isn't it? A temple upon the foundation of of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom the whole building, fitly framed together, groweth into an holy temple in the Lord, in whom ye are also builded together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. So he says that believers are, are called upon to be like bricks in a building, all fitting together well, different shapes, different sizes may be, and like the buildings that we see round about, they're all made of, of, of uniform, mass-produced bricks. In Bible times, of course, that wouldn't have been the case. Different bricks would have been chiselled out of the quarries, different sizes, different colours, different shapes. And that's what we are like, all with different skills. That's what we are being called upon to be. Giving God the glory as a special holy place. We move on then to our fifth key promise that Israel God said my people Israel one day will be at peace dwelling in their own land now is the nation of Israel there in their own land today dwelling in the land once given to their ancient forefathers the answer is yes absolutely the nation was re-established in 1948 and indeed has prospered ever since is Israel at peace? Well, I don't think you need me to tell you the answer to this question. No. There's never really been any true and lasting peace. There was war as soon as Israel was set up in 1948. There was a major conflict in 1967, the Six Day War. There was a major conflict in 1973, the Yom Kippur War. There have been wars and conflicts in and around Israel ever since. There are enemies, it seems, just about everywhere. Sometimes in the nations round about Israel, sometimes in our nation. And here we see those protesting against the nation of Israel. And I want to make it, make it very clear at this stage that we are not Zionists. 
as Christadelphians. We, we do not support the nation of Israel morally or financially. We believe that they are God's witnesses. They are God's people, God's reluctant witnesses, but they do witness to his existence. But we believe that there is a time of trouble yet coming for Israel there in their land. And so when we see, uh, you know, the bodies of Israeli soldiers there being flown back to Israel, when we see the wars that are built around certain sections of the land to try to keep Israel safe, we see that promise number five is a promise which is without doubt yet to be fulfilled. And then promise number six, that this ruler's throne, the throne of the Lord Jesus Christ, was going to be established forever. One king ruling for all time. You just imagine that we went out into the streets of Rugby, perhaps into the town centre, and we stopped a hundred people, and we asked whether they thought one worldwide ruler would be a good thing. What kind of answers do you think we would get? You see, what if that ruler was biased? What if that ruler was evil? What if that ruler was to die and passed on his position or her position to others and they didn't share those high standards of the one that had gone before? Well, this is why a divinely appointed ruler, the Lord Jesus Christ, the descendant of David, is the only answer. He will reign in righteousness. He will be absolutely, totally beyond bribery. And he will never die. So he'll never be replaced by another who will undo all the good work that he has done. Just, just complete a Psalm 2. And here we have some words which are, in fact, quoted in the New Testament, and we're told in the New Testament that these describe the Lord Jesus Christ. So as we read about this particular king reigning in Zion, we don't need to guess as to who this king is. We're told in Acts chapter 4 by the Apostle Peter that these things speak of the Lord Jesus. Psalm 2 and verse 2, the kings of the earth set themselves, the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed. Christ, of course, means anointed, okay, saying, let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. And once again, Acts chapter 4 quotes these words about the powers of the Gentiles hand in glove with the Jewish leaders gathered together against Jesus to put him to death. But as we move on through the psalm, we see that this is also a prophecy, not only of the work of the Lord Jesus 2,000 years ago, it's also a prophecy of the work of the Lord Jesus in the kingdom, work that is yet to be accomplished. So verse 6, Ask of me, says God, and I will give thee the heathen for thine inheritance, the Gentiles, the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. I will make you the king of all the earth, says God. And so, verse 9, thou shalt break them, enemies, with a rod of iron, thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Now be wise, therefore, O ye kings, be instructed, ye judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear, rejoice with trembling, kiss the son, lest he be angry, and ye perish from the way, when his wrath is kindled but a moment, a little. Blessed are all they that put their trust in him. Here we have the Lord Jesus Christ, God's anointed king, raised up to sit on David's throne there in Zion, ruling over the whole earth and wiping out those who would dare to rise up against him. Now there are those who claim that David's throne is in heaven. That because Israel turned against God, they showed themselves unworthy as recipients of his blessing. Therefore, the throne was transported to heaven. And that's where Jesus Christ sits now, there upon David's throne. Well, with respect, it cannot be, can it? We see here that David's descendant, the Lord Jesus Christ, verse 6, is not ruling in heaven, although that's where Jesus is now. This is a promise of Jesus sitting upon David's throne, where? In Zion or in Jerusalem. 
much as it's true that Israel did show themselves unworthy recipients of these blessings, we do not read of David's throne being transported to heaven. What city will be the capital of God's kingdom upon the earth? Where will Jesus reign from? There's no question about it. The Lord shall reign over them in Mount Zion from henceforth, even forever. Peace on earth when the Lord rules through his son in Zion in Jerusalem. Now our third section, and all these sections are not the same length, don't worry. Our third section asked when these promises are going to be fulfilled. Come back please to 2 Samuel chapter 7. We've already seen an indication that some of these things are already fulfilled. Some of them are yet to be. But David was told, there was no doubt about it, these things were going to take place after his death. So verse 12 of 2 Samuel chapter 7. But God says through Nathan to David, when thy days be fulfilled and thou shalt sleep with thy fathers, I will set up thy seed after thee, which shall proceed out of thy bowels and I will establish his kingdom. That's, a, that's the Bible language for death, isn't it? In the Bible, death is described as a sleep, a sleep from which somebody can be awoken. So David, this will happen after you die. It's even clearer in the Chronicles record, which is the comparison record of these things. It should come to pass, when thy days be expired, thou must go to be with thy fathers, I will raise up thy seed after thee. David, these things will happen when you are dead, after your death. However, look at verse 16. Thine house and thy kingdom shall be established forever before thee. Now, how can that promise be fulfilled? David, you are going to die, and I'm going to fulfill these promises after that time, and you will see it. Now, what's got to happen for these promises to be fulfilled? Well, could it be that David, upon his death, went to heaven? And there he sees the Lord Jesus Christ sitting upon his throne. Well, let's answer that question, please, in Acts chapter 2. And we're going to see just how it is that these promises will be fulfilled in front of David himself, before him. Is David in heaven above? Because, you know, if we go to heaven when we die, if anybody is going to receive an appropriate blessing such as that, well, it would be David. He was a great man. He was a man after God's own heart. Is David in heaven now? Verse 34, For David is not ascended into the heavens, but he saith himself, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou on my right hand, until I make thy foes thy footstool. So David is not ascended into heaven. How then can these promises be fulfilled if David has got to see these things happen? Verse 29 of Acts 2. Men and brethren, Peter says, let me freely speak unto you of the patriarch David. He is both dead and buried. His sepulchre is with us unto this day. Therefore... Being a prophet and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that of the fruit of his loins according to the flesh he would raise up Christ to sit on his throne. There's the promises to David fulfilled in Christ. He, verse 31, seeing this before, spake of the resurrection of Christ. That his soul was not left in hell, neither his flesh did see corruption. This Jesus hath God raised up, whereof we all are witnesses. How will David see these things by bodily resurrection? David will be raised and he will see Jesus, his greater son, also raised, sitting upon his throne. Now our fourth section, our fourth key question, simply asked, is there any possibility that these things are, are only speaking of Solomon? Solely of Solomon. This is the view that was expressed in the days of the Lord Jesus. He asked the leaders of his day, well, well who's David's son? Well, it's Solomon. Well, in which case, how does, how does David call him his Lord? You see, if the promises referred to only describe Solomon, then they would never be referred to again after Solomon's day, but they are. 
because 250 years after Solomon, in Amos chapter 9, we read about raising up the tabernacle of David that's fallen down. More than that, 450 years in the days of Jeremiah, God said through the prophets, if you can break my covenant of day and night, so if, you know, if the world stops turning, if the sun stops rising, I will break my covenant with Israel, my covenant with David. 500 years after Solomon, in Zechariah 12, we read, The Lord will save the tents of Judah first, that the glory of the house of David, there's our key phrase, the glory of the inhabitants of Jerusalem do not magnify themselves against Judah. And a thousand years after the days of Solomon, there in Luke 1, we've seen it already, the Lord will, God will give unto him the throne of his father, David. Let's then just sum up these six key promises and let's ask the question, what was promised and has it or has it not been fulfilled? And you'll see now the, the reason for this order. Promise number one, verse 12, that Jesus Christ would be David's son, David's descendant, born after David's death. Was it fulfilled? Absolutely. 2,000 years ago. Promise number two in verse 14 of 2 Samuel 7, that Jesus would be the son of God. Was that fulfilled? Absolutely. Joseph was not the biological father of the Lord Jesus Christ. Mary was his mother, but God was his father because he was conceived through the power of the Holy Spirit. Promise number three there in verse 15, that God would be merciful or would bless him. Absolutely. Right throughout the life of the Lord Jesus, he was blessed by God. Promise number four in verse 13, that Jesus would build a house for God's name. Has that been fulfilled? The answer is yes and no. Okay, spiritual house, yes, that's what we should be if we are serious about trying to serve God. Natural house, no, that temple is yet to be constructed in Jerusalem. We believe it will be when Jesus comes again. We hope and pray that that day will be soon. Promise number five, there in verse 10, Israel will dwell in their land in peace. No way, not yet. It will happen. It will happen when Jesus comes and that's when the sixth key promise will be fulfilled. The throne of Jesus established forever hasn't happened yet, but it will happen when Christ comes again. And what we see here is so typical of so much of Bible prophecy. Parts are fulfilled, so we can have absolute confidence that the other parts will, in due course themselves, also be. As Jesus came the first time, and indeed both the Bible and history books support the fact that there was a man called Jesus of Nazareth, we can be certain that he will come again. And when he does, will he come as a friend or as an enemy? Will he come to bless us for serving him or to condemn us for not believing his words? Because this is where we move to our final section. Probably the most important question this evening. How can these promises made so many years ago, made to David concerning the Lord Jesus Christ, how can they have any effect to us? How can they apply to you and me? Can we turn please to 2 Timothy chapter 4? You see, we might say, well, unless we are descended from David, then these things can't have any application in our lives. We might say, unless we are Jewish, descended from the man Abraham and his son Isaac and his grandson Jacob, well, these promises can't have any fulfilment. Well, that's not the case. Second Timothy chapter 4, and here we have some of the very last words that Paul ever wrote some of the most moving words that he ever wrote as well. Verse 6, he says, I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Paul was anticipating his death. He knew that this time was coming. Probably he was going to die as a martyr for his faith, and yet the hope that he had stretched out way beyond this life. 
And he knew that that hope was going to be realised. Now, look how Paul speaks of immortality. The blessing which was promised to him, and indeed which is promised to us. Verse 8. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord the righteous judge shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. A crown of of righteousness, not, not a crown of, of stones and silver and gold and, and, and precious metal like this one, the imperial state crown that was worn by Queen Elizabeth in her coronation in 1953. This is a crown of righteousness. This is immortality and incorruptibility which God has promised to all those that love him. Paul's hope was that that crown of righteousness might be his. It almost sounds as though he hoped that he would be a king one day. Well, yes, indeed, because this is what the Bible promises to all God's faithful children. We won't turn there, but in Revelation 5, we read these words. Those who were redeemed by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, faithful believers, they sung a song saying... Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood, out of every kindred, tongue, and people and nation. Just Israel? No. All sorts of people, all nationalities, and hast made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. The words of God are very clear, aren't they? Christ is coming. David's greater seed, David's greater son, he is coming to reign on earth. He is coming to sit on David's throne in power and in might. And when he does, then there is a place for every one of us at his side. If we obey what the Bible teaches and if we prepare ourselves now for that great and wondrous time. Thank you very much for listening this evening.